Hey guys, in this video, I am going to discuss with you a very very important clinical case which you may often find in your orthopedic OPD in the wards very often. Right? This is one of the commonest patient that will visit your OPD often occasionally almost you can say every week you will have some five to six patients in your OPD if it's a you know good orthopedic hospital. Okay, so this particular case that I'm going to present in front of you today is not only important for PGME examination from where you will have multiple MCQs out of this topic. This is also important for your university examination. If this case is present in your ward, definitely something will be asked to you, maybe as a short case, maybe as a spotter, maybe as something. It will definitely be there in your particular viva, in your orthopedic examination. Let's see what I've got today for you to present this particular case. So the case, I just show you one video how this particular patient he presented to our hospital his gate his walk into the entrance area let's have a look so see the whole purpose of showing you this video was that when this patient came into our hospital he was walking with the you know support of calipers without calipers he cannot walk it simply means that he won't be able to put his weight on the lower limbs right so he is using calipers on both the sides and the problem is basically on the right side what was the problem? Why he is walking with the help of calipers? Is he having some power loss? Is he having something, you know, additional, some problem in the limb because of which the bones are not allowing the weight transmission? Let's see what he was actually having. Okay. So let's start with our clinical case presentation. So today's case, the case scenario was a 60 year old male presenting Mr. ABC. I have just hidden the original name, just remove the original name. So there is a 60 year old male. Mr. ABC, who is son of Mr. XYZ and a resident of Madhya Pradesh state, presented with. Now, I do believe those who have started their postings, whether you are in second year, third year, final year, everybody knows what is the relevance of putting your father's name over here. Because two patients might be having the same name and they can be easily differentiated by the name of father. What is the relevance of residence? Residence, everybody knows in particular state, in certain states, certain diseases are more common as compared to the other. For example, if somebody gives you an x-ray, like in the recently conducted exam, the INI, there was a question regarding, uh, there is a patient who is having skeletal sclerosis. The bones are white and the patient presented from Bihar. So we know in Bihar, certain regions, they are having more of, you know, a presentation of these fluoride content in the water. And we know that fluorosis is a reason for white bones, the sclerosis of the bone. So that is the relevance of residence into which state to which region the patient is belonging he might be suffering from that particular disorder okay so our patient is a 60 year old male who is presenting to us with complaints of inability to bear weight on the right lower limb okay shortening of right lower limb and discharge through right lower femur what exactly the chief complaint means? The chief complaint means what the patient is telling you, not what you are observing. Okay. So patient is telling me that he is not able to bear the weight on the right lower limb. Point taken. He is saying that my right leg is shorter as compared to the left leg. Fine. Point taken. He is saying I am having discharge through right lower femur. Actually, he won't be saying you that I am having discharge through right lower femur. So instead of femur, I should have written over here that discharge through right lower Thigh. That is the point that I should take. So third point should be discharge through right lower thigh. Right? The duration of all these complaints, all the three complaints, it is around five to six years. He came to us walking with the support of the calipers, and these are the three complaints that he told us. Let's see what we have in the history of present illness. So patient who is a 60-year-old male, Mr. ABC, he got a road traffic accident when. He got a road traffic accident around 5 to 6 years back. Fine. For which, for which he was treated at a local hospital. Okay. As per patient. Now the patient. What he told us. As per patient. He was diagnosed as a case of fracture. Both bones. Right leg. And right thigh. So patient is telling. Sir I was informed by the primary treating person. That I am having a fracture of both bones. On the leg. And the thigh bone also. That is what patient told us. At the time of accident, the bone came out of the skin from the leg as well as thigh. So what this point tells us, this is very important. Patient is now telling us that when I met the accident, at the time of accident, both the bones of the leg as well as the thigh, both the sides, the bone was outside the skin. 
So what inference can I make out of this history that patient has given me? It's a very, very important thing. What exactly is that? That it was probably a kind of open fracture. We are right on that. So there was a fracture, diagnosed as a case of fracture and the patient was diagnosed as a case of open fracture. He was having an open fracture, right? There is no document with the patient at present mentioning stage. This is what the patient has told us. There is no evident document. There is no supporting document which, you know, mentioned this thing that it was a case of open fracture, that it was the bone was outside skin, that there was a fracture of both bone legs. This is all what the patient is still. Okay. So he was operated and plating was done in both tibia as well as femur. So he was having some fracture in, if you believe the patient, he was having an open fracture and he was operated and plating was done. That is what patient is telling us. Patient is having old x-rays for the same. So he is not having any other document, you know, evidence for the same that it was an open fracture. It was a tibia fracture as well as fibula with femur. But he is having x-rays which is suggesting something. Then he says, after two months of surgery, the patient started having discharge from the lower thigh region. After two months of surgery, the patient started having the discharge from the lower thigh region. Right? So, most likely when it was an open fracture, and now he has started getting discharged. What inference comes to my mind? Some infection is there. Either this infection can be of the bone, can be of the soft tissue, you know. But infection is surely there. That is for sure. He went to the primary surgeon and some procedure was done about which patient is not aware of and there is no document available. So patient was operated some 5-6 years back because of road traffic accident. And after that accident, some plating was done. Probably that was an open fracture. After the doing that plating, the patient started having discharge from the lower thigh region. He went to the surgeon again and there was some procedure done. If I believe the patient, it suggests me that there was some sort of infection. And for this infection, he went to the primary surgeon. Probably some sort of cleaning, some sort of debridement. Some, right? So this is the history of present illness of our patient who is right now walking on calipers. Let's move. Let's see what all we have in the history of the patient. Okay. History of past illness, there is no history of any other chronic illness in the past like diabetes or hypertension or thyroid disorder. Now, in this particular case, if you see the open fracture and a discharge, it seems to me there is some infection somewhere. There is some infection somewhere. Now, what is the relevance of this particular past illness when you talk about this, all this? So, we know that diabetes is one condition which can worsen the healing of the bone which can worsen the healing of the skin, you know, post-trauma or after any kind of injury, even after any kind of stitches which are given, okay? So, there is something uh, which can be wrong if the patient is suffering from diabetes. Hypertension as such has nothing to do with the healing of the bone, but yes, we should know that what are the medications he is taking because when you are prescribing the medication or you are, you know, trying to uh, make the patient ready for OT, we should know what all drugs to be stopped, what all drugs need to be uh, modified according to the dosage. So, these histories are very, very important, right? So, diabetes is one condition which can actually hamper the healing of the bone as well as the skin. We should know that, okay? Let me tell you, give you one uh, additional information here. It is generally said that when the blood sugar level, it is more than so that you have given the stitches, okay? That is one additional piece of information I could uh, just give you from here. Let's see, in the personal history, what we have, patient is a chronic smoker, okay, and taking almost two bundles of BD per day for last 30 years, right? So, two bundles of BD, I do believe there are almost around uh, 10 to 20 BDs per packet. So, if I'm not wrong, they, he is taking almost 20 to 30 BDs per day minimum, and that too for last 30 years. So, he has been a chronic smoker for so long. What, you know, inference I can make out from here? Examiner can very well ask you, what is the point? Why are you telling me personal history? So, you can very well say, sir, smoking. Smoking is something which actually decreases the immunity, which actually can hamper with the healing again of the bone as well as of the skin. So, this smoking could have been one of the reasons why this patient started having the discharge. Why probably the bone is not healing well? Why probably the skin is not healing well? So, this smoking is a risk factor which actually hampers the healing, right? So, smoking, it delays 
the healing of the bone. That is the important point here. That delays the healing of fractures, skin healing. So any kind of fracture or skin healing, it will be delayed if the patient is a smoker. So you have to ask all your patients who will be undergoing surgery for one or other reason that they should not smoke. Okay. Family history, there is nothing significant in this particular family history. General examination of the patient. The patient when examined, he was lying supine on the bed and he was looking comfortable. He was not looking toxic. He was not looking very ill. You know, uh, he was not having any condition or any kind of facial appearance, which tells me that patient is in severe pain or in severe kind of trouble. No, he was comfortable, right? Why he was comfortable? Probably the reason was because he is having this particular problem for last five to six years. And now he is habitual to it. It's fine. It's a part of daily routine. Okay, that's why probably he was looking comfortable. There was pallor. We start from the beginning. So I do believe that everybody knows when you are talking about the general examination, you have to talk from head to toe, step by step. So I have taken my relevant points like pallor was present over there. There was no jaundice, no ictus, no sinuses in the lips area, in the nose, in the ear, pinna, no. Oral hygiene was not satisfactory. So he is not having, you know, good oral hygiene. Pulse was 80. BP was okay. SpO2 was okay on room air. So all the parameters seem to be fine. There was no pedal edema. Right? So this is broadly I have taken in general examination. When we went for systemic examination, the CNS, the patient was conscious oriented to time place person. CVS was okay. Respiratory was okay. So uh, there was no added sound and bowel sounds were present. Abdomen was soft. So all in all, the systemic findings were not that definitive. There was no, uh, you know, a positive thing that makes me think he's having something systemic wrong. So he's walking on two calibers. He could have been having a weakness of the limb. That's why he's not able to walk. But systemic examination was absolutely fine. So there is no systemic problem. So something related to the local region is affected. What exactly? So when we talk about the local examination, the patient was comfortably lying supine on the couch where he was keeping the right lower limb extended at the hip as well as the knee. But there is some degree of flexion of the knee. There is some degree of flexion of the knee. You can see that the Macintosh is here. There is an appreciable gap between the bed and the knee. So he cannot extend the knee actually completely. He tries to keep the knee extended, but there is some degree of flexion over there. So 15 to 20 degrees. How do I, how do I measure it? Right now, it is a general local examination. So I'm not measuring it. When I go for the specific, you know, examination, then how will I measure the degree measurement? What I'll do, I'll mark one line at the long axis of the femur. And then I'll mark one line from the long axis of the tibia. And then I measure this. This is approximately 15 to 20 degrees of the knee flexion. The apparatus that you use to measure the angle is what you call as the goniometer. That is what you call as the goniometer. Okay. So if they ask you in your exam, how do you measure it? It's done by goniometer. If you go to the orthopedic ward, there are a few things which should be there in your pocket. One of them is a measuring tape. And other one is what you call a goniometer to measure the angle if there is any kind of discrepancy. Okay. So this is the angle. So the patient is keeping trying to keep the hip extended, knee extended with knee in around 15 to 20 degrees of flexion. And there seems to be some shortening of 8 centimeters on the right side as compared to the left side. Now, when you talk about this, you all can appreciate right heel is over here. Left heel is over here. So how did I measure that there is a shortening of 8 centimeter now in local examination? So I told you about the angle, goniometer, about the shortening. How do we measure it? So again, I want to clarify one important concept here. There is a concept of true and apparent measurement. There is a concept of true and apparent measurement. Okay. I do believe when you are going now this year for your final year examination, everybody is having the knowledge. Everybody has cleared their concept. What exactly is true measurement and what exactly is apparent measurement right so again i'll just revise in a very quick uh, uh, form now what is the meaning of true measurement true measurement means both the pelvis both the asis here both the asis here should be on the same line should be on the same plane so when asis is on the same plane and then you measure the length of the limb that's what you call a true measurement okay so for measuring what we do we take a fixed bony point in this particular patient what i did i fix my inch tape on the manubrium Okay, so I mark one point here. I just uh, mark the ASIS. Are they on the same level or no? Once I confirm that they are on the same level, from here I measure till medial middle line. 
and then I measured till this medial milia. So the difference between these two medial milia was around eight centimeters. The difference was around eight centimeters. So what I said, there is a true shortening. So instead of saying there seems to be a shortening, the examiner can ask you what kind of shortening do you say? True shortening or apparent shortening? So I can very well say, sir, it's a true shortening. How did you say true shortening? Sir, when I measured the shortening, both the ASIS, they were at the same position. Did you confirm it? Yes, sir, I confirmed it. Did you mark it? Yes, sir, I marked with it, uh, it with a marker. So third thing that should be in your pocket, along with the goniometer, along with the inch tape, is a marker. You must have that in your pocket. Okay. So this is a true shortening of how much? 8 centimeters. So there is a flexion deformity here. How much? Around 15 to 20 degrees, which I measured by goniometer, which will be very, very specific then, either 15 or 20. And then we have got 8 centimeter shortening. So I do believe you are clear with this concept of true and apparent measurement. If you are not, I have already made one video, specially for true and apparent measurements. Please go through it. It's on the YouTube channel. You must see that. Okay. If you're not clear about the concept. Okay. So now we have a patient who is having what? Who is having a knee flexion deformity of how much? 15 to 20 degrees and a centimeter shortening on the right side. And what I mentioned, right side thigh as compared to the left side. So what I mean to tell the examiner, where is the shortening? Is the shortening in the thigh or is the shortening in the leg? Actually, I mean to tell the examiner that the shortening is in the right thigh. Now examiner asked me, how did you came to know the shortening is in the thigh and it is not in the leg? So I tell again the examiner, sir, what I did, I'll just tell the examiner, sir, what I did, I started from point one. I marked a knee joint line. What is a knee joint line? The medial knee joint line means the area between the lower end of femoral condyle and the upper end of tibia. I marked the line here at the knee joint area, the knee joint line. So I marked the point at knee joint line. So I measured from point one to point two on both the sides. Okay. I measured from here till here and here till here. And then from knee joint line, I measured till medial medulla. So when I measured this distance, when I measured the distance between two and three, it was equal on both the sides. But the distance between 1 and 2 was shorter on the right side. So I know the discrepancy is basically in the thigh area. And what is the more easier way to mark it? I'll just explain that also to you. So examiner says, no, no, there can be a problem with the spine also. The patient might be having a scoliosis also. So how do you know it is a problem in the thigh? So the best way is you have to mark from ASIS to the medial knee joint line. ASIS to the medial knee joint line. Now, from ASIS to the medial joint line, I am considering two objects. One is a pelvis. One is a pelvis. And second is a femur. I know that the problem is with femur because he has been operated for femur. So, when ASIS of right side is marked and measured till the knee joint, right, from point 1 to point 2, the distance will be lower. It will be shorter as compared to when you see on the same side, when you see the same thing on the left side. So mark from ASIS to the medial knee joint line and measure this one, right? The line B. So line A will be shorter as compared to line B. So that tells me the shortening is in the thigh area. If I want to measure the leg, I can join from medial knee joint line to the medial medialis. I can measure it. This distance will be same on both the sides. So I know problem is on the right thigh. That's why I said very, very confidently to my examiner, sir, the problem is on the problem is on the right thigh. So what is our local examination saying? The patient is having a flexion deformity as well as a shortening, right? Now, other thing I said, there is a sinus present on lower thigh with discharge to it. So these were the sinuses. These were multiple sinuses which were present through which the patient was having discharge. So three important findings I have in my patient in local examination. Flexion deformity number one, shortening here on the right thigh number two and sinus discharge here number three. So my patient is having three problems. One special thing I want to show you where for which the patient actually didn't came to us. But yes, that, you know, sometimes might take your attention. See this. Can you see this white patch here? This was a piece of tibia which was coming out of the skin. But the patient clearly refused us. Sir, please don't touch my leg. No, you have to treat for this problem only. Because I am not able to put my weight because there is a discharge from my thigh. So don't touch my leg. It is fine. The bone is coming out. Leave it. Don't touch it. But you just 
treat my thigh, right? So with all the written and informed consent of the patient as well as the attendant, we took the patient, we admitted the patient that we will be only dealing with the thigh and the patient is not giving permission to operate on the leg. The bone is outside and it might lead to some kind of trouble tomorrow. So I as a surgeon don't want to take a onus. So I took a concern and after the consent is taken, I just take the patient for surgical intervention or I admitted him. So what can be our differential diagnosis for this case looking at the history of the patient, the presentation of the patient? What can be the two possible diagnoses? Probably it is a post-operative chronic osteomyelitis of right femur. Okay, please correct me if I'm wrong. It is a post-operative case. So examiner asked me, what is your differential diagnosis? Sir, probably it is a post-operative chronic osteomyelitis of right femur. Now examiner says, please justify every word that you have just said. So I say, sir, patient is giving me history that he has been operated. Patient is giving me history that he has been operated and and after the surgery, there are multiple discharging sinuses on the lower thigh. That is why I am saying chronic osteomyelitis. So examiner says, why chronic? Because sinus is present. Sinus discharge is not a part of the acute osteomyelitis. It's a part of chronic osteomyelitis only, right? So patient told us it's a post-operative case. We agreed to it. And it's a chronic osteomyelitis of femur. Why femur? Because the shortening is of the femur only. Because the discharge is coming from the lower end of femur only. Lower thigh only. Okay. Upper femoral discharge will not come from the lower thigh. They will come from upper thigh only. Okay. Or if it is not a bony infection, what else it can be? Examiner asks you, what else it can be? You can simply say, sir, might be some soft tissue infection. Quite a possibility. He is having some accumulated pus over there. He might be having some infection of the hip, which has traveled down to the thigh. He has got some sinus discharge. It might be some fungal infection, which is leading to some, you know, sinus. So it can be some soft tissue infection or it can be osteomyelitis. That is to my differential diagnosis. I can make out at a usual level. So examiner says, okay, fine. Examiner now gives you, he asks you what all documents the patient is having right now. So you tell him that, sir, the examine, uh, the patient is giving me one old x-ray. Okay. So examiner asks you, can you please explain the x-ray? You say, yes, sir. Why not? I can easily exam, I can easily explain it. So you, how do you explain this particular x-ray? So you have to explain this like this. This is a x-ray. This is a plain x-ray, right? Why we are saying this is an x-ray plain. Not any kind of contrast is used. No dye is used. Nothing has been used. So this is a plain x-ray. AP and lateral view. This is a plain x-ray. AP and lateral view of knee joint. Of knee joint. Including. Including what? Including lower end of femur. Including lower end of femur. And. And. Upper end of tibia and fibula. Upper end of, sorry. Upper end of tibia and fibula. With what else? So this is a plain x-ray of the knee joint, AP and lateral knee, showing the lower end of the femur, upper end of tibia and fibula, with, with a implant, with an implant fixed to lower femur with the implant fixed to lower femur. So you can see there is a plate which is fixed. Now if you know what kind of plate it is, you can very well say sir, this is a locking plate, locking femoral plate has been you know placed. If you don't know the implant, if you are not very much aware of the implant, you can say with the implant fixed to the lower femur with screws, with screws and what else and the most important thing and you can see this, the bone is okay till here but here we don't see any bone. But here, if you see this region, here we don't see any bone. What exactly has happened? This is what you call the non-union, isn't it? So it is suggestive of what? And non-union. Non-union of femur. With what else? With what else? What are these? What are these? Can you say what are these? If you have seen some other x-rays like this, can you make out what are these things? These are antibiotic impregnated cemented beads the cement like if you remember from my lecture we discuss about the bone cement that is which one the pmma polymethyl methacrylate so what has been done over here is these antibiotic cement these cemented beads have been mixed with antibiotics 
and now the primary operating surgeon has left the beads here only so that from these beads the antibiotic will keep on getting released and that will not allow the infection to settle right so with 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 cemented beads with cemented beads now you don't call it antibiotic impregnated because i don't know whether they are antibiotic impregnated or no now examiner ask me what is the use of the cemented beads so now you can say sir these are used these antibiotic be these cemented beads are used and they are mixed with antibiotics so that the antibiotics keep on getting released from here and it doesn't allow the formation of infection at this particular site that is the purpose of using the antibiotic beads over here right so these are antibiotic impregnated cemented beads remember this please right these are cemented beads so what is my x ray showing me ap and lateral view of the knee joint lower end of femur upper end of tibia fibula with the implant fixed to the lower femur with screws and non union of the femur can be seen with cemented beads am i clear on that i hope that much of x ray everybody can now easily define yeah so now examiner ask you okay doctor okay you know tell me your final diagnosis so now you can say sir this is a chronic osteomyelitis of right femur which we said how it happened so you can very well add a word here sir this is a post operative this is a post operative chronic osteomyelitis of right femur with flexion deformity of the knee which ideally you should mention that how much let's say 20 degree flexion deformity of the knee with how much shortening with 8 cm shortening of the right lower limb and here while mentioning the diagnosis you should be very very specific that this lower limb shortening is at where it is at femur so now what is my final diagnosis post operative chronic osteomyelitis of right femur with 20 degree flexion deformity of the knee with 8 cm shortening of the right femur this is my final diagnosis i hope i am clear till here and it's not very very difficult so there are so many things that we can discuss as a part of chronic osteomyelitis you all know that all the three hallmarks of chronic osteomyelitis are very very important they are very very important let's see what are the hallmarks okay this is a final diagnosis right now what should be the next step what should be the next step now before i move further i should be able to explain this x ray examiner can have a pretty more you know few questions to ask but all other things that he might ask me that he asked me you told me it's a case of chronic osteomyelitis now prove with this x ray that it's chronic osteomyelitis right now to just to discuss with you chronic osteomyelitis i do believe everybody knows what are the hallmarks of chronic osteomyelitis what are the hallmarks of chronic osteomyelitis do you remember can you please put that in the comment section the so hallmark number 1 what do we call it sequestrum what is that sequestrum it's a dead bone which is surrounded by granulation tissue and this sequestrum we know it should be more sclerotic it is usually sclerotic as compared to the rest of the bone because there is no demineralization right so one is sequestrum other thing that we can see in chronic osteomyelitis it can be involucrum how do you define involucrum how do you define involucrum so what is involucrum involucrum is a reactive new bone and third is what you call a cloaca and what is that cloaca cloaca is a opening in involucrum so where are all these three things in this x ray so you have to tell the examiner sir these pieces of the bone that you see over here these pieces of the bone which have got no vascularity this all area is what you call as the sequestrum these are known as sequestrum the dead pieces of the bone right and these blank area will be having lot of granulation tissue abscess frank pus okay and this whiteness can you see this whiteness all around this bone the all whiteness it is not appreciable in the lower part but yes still here you see this all whiteness is what you call as involucrum so involucrum is what it is a reactive new bone where all around the sequestrum so that it tries to make a boundary around the sequestrum which is not getting possible over here but this extra density is what we call as in involucrum okay so involucrum and sequestrum these are two important things you should remember this bone is not united at all this bone is not united at all and these screw you can see it is in the middle part only 
it is lying nowhere it has just been placed so bone has got already resolved from here so it's in fiction so i can say sir chronic why it is a chronic osteomyelitis because it is showing me the, the bone sequestrum also this is showing me some sclerosis also and above all the patient presentation tells me the pus is coming out that means the sinus is on the skin so it's a case of chronic osteomyelitis right so this is our diagnosis that's how we have to present to the examiner examiner ask you what do you think what should you, you should do so what further investigation you would like to get done let's enlist the examination the uh, you know further investigation that you would like to get done in this patient what should be the next step my first next step should be first to get the blood parameters done so that i can know uh, how much is the level of infection so i'll get a complete blood count i know that what thing it will give me tlc counts will be increased my right on that tlc counts will be raised so they will be raised second i'll get the inflammatory markers i have asr and crp done and if it is in active phase these two will be raised again these two will be raised again asr and crp i'll get a fresh x ray done this is what the patient has brought to me x ray ap and lateral views never a single view i hope everybody remembers the rule of 2 so this should be not fresh three things done do i need mri here no because i already know it's infection i don't want to find it out it's already there one thing important thing that i can get done now you know that for chronic osteomyelitis what is your first treatment that you always plan for it is surgery no but before surgery you have to know where is the sequestrum actually lying what is the source of the sinus so what i can get done is one important investigation which is known as sinogram what is that sinogram in sinogram what we do we inject a dye from the sinus and that tracks the pathway from where the sinus the collection from where it is coming so that when you are going for a surgery you are already aware that which area i have to target right that is our motto so sinogram can be done once you have taken the patient for sinogram what else would you like to take whatever the abscess is coming out i would like to send that pus that collection for what culture and sensitivity and i do believe everybody remembers for your exam pgme purpose also that this is one of the most important investigation why because based on the reports of this culture culture sensitivity i'll get the organism as well as i'll get the antibiotic that i need to use so organism as well as antibiotic organism as well as antibiotic i have to see from pus culture and sensitivity got the point these are the broad investigation that i would like to get done in these patients right practically telling these are all theoretically practically telling also these all five should be done in all the patient but sometimes some people they skip the sinogram right because they say that i already can see the infection very very clearly on this x ray why should i get it done but sometime sinogram can be very very helpful it can show you those sites also which might not be you know uh, appreciable on the typical x rays so you must get these investigations done right now if the examiner ask you okay i am satisfied with whatever you are doing but now what surgery would you like to do what treatment would you like to do so you have to tell them sir we can start the antibiotic depending on the pus culture and sensitivity report but the primary aim here would be to remove the infected foci isn't it so to remove the infected foci so what should be my treatment plan for this patient so when i talk about the treatment plan always always remember if you ever get a question in your pgme examination that a patient has presented with so and so presentation there is a plate there is a implant now it has got infected now what to do so always remember when it is already a case of chronic osteomyelitis and an implant is there it should be always and always implant removal you have to remove the implant until unless the implant is removed the infection is not going to heal of the bone so implant removal will be the first thing okay let's presume that we have removed the implant now what what next second is for chronic osteomyelitis what surgery we do we remove the sequestrum so second i'll go for sequestrectomy second i'll go for sequestrectomy so i'll cut what i'll cut all the dead bone i'll cut all the dead bone so implant removal along with the implant removal all these beads remember these all the uh, cemented beads will also have to be removed so remove the implant and remove the cemented beads one second remove the sequestrum now the question comes examiner ask you okay you are removing the sequestrum how do you come to know that sequestrum is gone and now it is a healthy bone how do you come to know so if you remember from the class notes if you remember from the class notes you are told a very very special sign which is known as paprika sign remember that 
what was that paprika sign so when you will keep on removing this bone cut and cut and cut there will be a point when you will see that the bony ending the bony ending is showing you multiple blood you know bleeding points right so that's what you call a paprika sign so where do you see paprika sign paprika sign is something to be seen in chronic osteomyelitis what is that when you keep on removing the dead bone there will be a point when the healthy bone comes and how would you recognize healthy bone by the multiple bleeding points like this okay so you keep on removing the bones as the uh, healthy bone comes you will be able to see the paprika sign so sequestectomy done right so implant removal cemented bead removal remove whatever is already there then remove the dead bone that is sequestectomy and after that what to do implant is removed now let's suppose let's suppose you have removed the implant and now you have removed this much of bone so now what should we do for this much of gap this is a huge gap initially the patient is having 8 cm shortening and now after your removal the shortening will increase to almost 20 25 cm now what to do what you will do so examiner asked you this is almost a shortening of now 20 to 25 cm now what is your plan now here you can be in trouble now here you can stop your viva and you can simply say sorry sir i don't know because you are a final year student so he will not be expecting you and do believe if you have crossed your history if you have crossed your clinical examination you are already pass if you have gone to this step where he is discussing the investigations and treatment part with you you are already cleared the exam so don't worry about it don't hesitate in saying sorry don't utter a wrong thing but you know simply say sorry if you don't know anything so do believe me if you have cleared your history part you are clear already if you have gone to the examination part you are pass already right he is discussing with you the investigation and treatment part you have topped the exam already that is for sure okay nobody is going to fail you now if you say sorry but now i tell you what was the plan what we did was the plan so what we did we removed the implant we cut the dead bone we removed all the dead bone all the dead bone was removed all this area was removed and there was a gross shortening and the shortening was in actual it was 25 cm it was 25 cm shortening in between the right leg and the left leg. the right femur was almost 25 cm short as compared to the left side so what we did we applied the only implant which can save this limb which can help me to regain the length this much of length the only implant that i have can you name that implant everybody knows that implant for limb lengthening the only implant i have and yes that's what you call elixir so what we did we removed all this dead tissue we removed all the old present implant cemented beads and what we did we just put a elizaro frame like this on the patient right now in very very short i will just explain to you what we did with this elizaro what was our aim i'll try to explain that to you okay now you see this is a healed x ray basically this x ray is of july the patient was initially operated in january i'll tell you the sequence of events now the patient was initially operated in january 2021 he was operated and he was given a elizar we know that elizar helps in growing bone how much at what speed it grows at 1 mm per day approximately so if i calculate per 30 days it should be 30 mm per day uh, per 30 mm per month not day approximately 3 cm so it is 3 cm per month the patient should be able to have the lengthening he presented to me in july he presented to me just now in july and he said that just remove my elizaro frame my sinus is healed now if you see this particular patient this is of his this particular visit when he came to us there is no sinus all the implant everything this scar mark is of the implant which we remove so there is no sinus discharge it is absolutely healed right and you can see the ring number 1 is there this is ring number 1 this is ring number 2 this is ring number 3 and this is ring number 4 so what we did we applied a four ring assembly to the patient what was the plan the plan was the patient is having a shortening of how much approximately 25 cm so we applied the elizaro i'll explain to you how it worked so what was the you know uh, what was the plan that there should be a lengthening of 3 cm per month so starting from january february march april may and june and he presented in july okay so 5 months he was doing his lengthening for 5 months so broadly he was able to attain a lengthening of 15 cm 
when again right now he presented to me again we measured it very very accurately it was 8 cm shortening still when he presented to me in the month of july again new 8 cm shortening why because every month he has been doing it so 3 into 5 15 cm if the patient keeps the ilizaro for another 2 months he will be able to 2 or 2 and half months so 3 into 2 will be 6 or 3 into 2.5 approximately will be 7.5 centimeters so in around 2.5 to 3 months he should be able to cover up this length but he was not ready he just said my sinus is healed i am ready to accept the shortening and you please remove it i am not liking this ilizaro so when you read about ilizaro in your textbook also it is clearly mentioned that why ilizaro is not preferred by surgeons because it is not accepted by the patients but believe me it is one of the most wonderful implant in the history which has been created this implant can help you in these complicated cases of osteomyelitis or wherever there is a length short the limb length is short okay so what was the plan so this was again i'll tell you in very short and by looking at the x-ray i do believe you'll be able to understand what we did so this is ring four okay this was ring three this is ring two and there is one ring above sorry there is one ring above the first thing is not visible in the x-ray so what was our plan? What we initially did, this was the site from where we removed the, you know, implant uh, the, from the uh, the infected bone. This was the initial site from where we removed the infected bone along with the implant. This was the region of infected bone. Okay. Now how these two bones they came together? This was the distal part of the femur, which was here only. So what we did, we applied one ring on the femur upper part, one ring. This is ring one. This was ring two. So what we did, we just Cut the bone, we just cut the femur, corticotomy. This is what you call corticotomy, cutting the cortex. So that's what you call corticotomy. So we did a corticotomy here. We just cut the bone. Okay. We took a saw and we cut the bone through and through. Nothing else was done. Only cutting the bone was done. Then this ring and ring two. Ring three was fixed to the middle fragment. So we have now fragment one. We have now fragment two and we have this distal fragment three. Okay, you can easily recognize this. So what we did, we did a corticotomy here between the ring one and two. What the point? And then we asked the patient to loosen these nuts, to loosen these nuts, and keep on shifting the ring two towards ring three, ring three and ring four. The ring four is fixed where to the distal part. I'll explain that again. Ring four, it is the distal part. Okay, you will understand the beauty of Elizaro. This is the ring four. And this is fixed to the distal part. One ring is here, which is fixed to the proximal part. So these two rings will not move at all. These two rings will remain in place, in position. Then what we did, we fixed two rings, we fixed another two rings in the proximal part of bone only. This was ring two and this was ring three. Between ring three and ring four was the infected area. We removed all that area. This was the area which was actually having shortening, which was showing you the gap, right? What we did then, we cut the bone from here and we taught patient that how you have to loosen these nuts so that the ring 2 and 3, they can be moved together towards what? Towards ring 4. So gradually, what was the speed? The speed was 1 mm per day. We taught the patient that how the ring 2 and 3 have to be moved towards ring 4. What was the purpose? The purpose was we have cut a healthy bone. We just cut it. We didn't remove anything, we just cut it. So when the patient is moving the ring 2 and 3 towards ring 4, 1 mm per day, what will happen? New bone will keep on getting formed. Where? Between this fragment and this fragment. So we are making a new callus here. At what speed? 1 mm per day. The rate of growth of bone is what? 1 mm per day. At what rate the patient is moving the ring? 1 mm per day. So with every 1 mm, when the patient is moving the ring, there will be new bony formation here. So where we are going to see the new callus? New callus will be seen here. This is the site where we will be able to see new callus and at there will be a point when this fragment, middle fragment will touch the last point. Okay. So ring 2 and 3, they have connected the middle fragment to the lower fragment. Now this is what you call docking. That's what you call docking. Now this fragment, these two fragments are now together. These two fragments are now together. So what we have done, we have increased the length of limb. How? From a healthy part of the bone. This is what you call corticotomy. So this is the principle of Elizaro that you do a cutting of the bone on upper part and you gradually keep on moving the bone down and down and down so that will maintain the length of the limb. So where was the original bone loss? 
original bone lost from here. We removed it, but we kept on making new bone upwards, and this middle part of the bone will keep on shifting down and down. Right? That is the principle of using Illis arrow. So this was distraction osteogenesis. Okay, that is what we did. So this was this was our final patient, a happy patient who actually accepted eight centimeter shortening. Doesn't want Illis arrow anymore. Got for removal of Illis arrow. But he said, "Sir, I am a village man. I am a farmer. I can do my farming with this because the discharge is gone. So now I am not worried about the infection. Now this is fine with me. I can accept the shortening. I'll accept whatever shortening eight centimeter it is. I am ready to give you in writing." And he accepted it. He got the frame removal, and now he has gone gone uh, back to his home. Okay. So this is an interesting case by which you can understand multiple MCQs, sequestrum, the involucrum, the paprika sign about Illis arrow. About the measurement of the limb, presentation of the patient, X-ray findings. So there are a lot many things to learn from this particular case for your practical examination of university as well as for PG&E examination also, right? So please do provide me the feedbacks about this particular case presentation, right? You can leave your comments in the chat box or you can very well convey to me also. I do believe um, some of you might be on my group, on my Telegram group, on the DBMC Premier group. So wherever you are, please do provide me the comments. And uh, do let me know on what all cases you would like me to present. You know cases like this. Okay, so all the very very best for the upcoming I uh, this uh, neat exam.